a beautiful pregnancy. We're very excited that we're gonna have a girl. Very easy going. I just determined I was destined to have babies. We were already preparing and trying to decide how we we're gonna decorate. Everything was great. We had multiple ultrasounds, thought everything would be perfect. We went to the hospital and, you know, it was just, it was going to be a great day. Had a wonderful delivery. It was quick and easy, four hours, and she was here. When they gave her to me to hold, I just, I knew. I knew something just told me something was wrong with her. All of Emma's conditions were not known when I was pregnant. All the tests that were done previously didn't indicate that there was going to be any problem, you know, that it was going to be, you know, a smooth delivery and that she was going to be normal and healthy. I had seen both of my nephew's deliveries and, and kind of knew what to expect, what they should look like and things like that, and, and she came out purple. She was not the pretty pink I was anticipating she would be. I was watching Emma being born, but I was also watching the other, the other dynamics in the room. Right from the onset, I knew that there was something wrong. The nurse took her and said, you know, we're going to take her down to the, the NICU. We had no idea what was going on. We knew if something was, was very wrong, but we didn't know exactly what, what had happened. Her pediatrician, who didn't really even have permission to be at the hospital, shows up at the hospital. That's not a very good sign. Three hours had gone by, and nobody had said anything to us. Um, so I was getting very, very anxious. My first child, I want my baby. Eventually, what, they would come back and say that she had a, a heart condition. They didn't know exactly what it was, but she'd have to go to Arnold Palmer Hospital, you know, as soon as possible, and they had already called for a transport. Emma was born with multiple congenital heart defects, so the first, most complex one is called transposition of the great vessels, where your pulmonary artery and your aorta are backwards. And her second condition is a ventricular septal defect, which is a hole between the ventricles and pulmonary atresia, which is the narrowing of her lung artery. Most babies born with this condition, if they're completely untreated, will die within the first year of life. This was a very serious condition that mandated a surgical intervention as a, as a newborn baby. We had us come into the NICU. Um, to see her, um, and they tried to give me a chance to hold her. And every time I held her, her heart rate would drop, her oxygen levels would drop, and they would keep telling me, we need you to put her back under the oxygen. Um, and that just, it just killed me. Every first mom just wants to sit there and hold their baby and, and just sit there for hours, and, and I couldn't do that now. Because um, I knew every time I tried to hold her, I was hurting her. I went back to uh, our house, and um, we had already had her room decorated. <laughs> That's what really hit. I just sat in the middle of the room and cried, not knowing what was going to happen. So at six days, Emma's first surgery was performed. And uh, they implanted a BT shunt into her heart. And that essentially was just used to provide extra blood flow through her heart and let her grow. They just needed her to be a little older, be a little bigger, um, a little have a little more weight on her to perform the next procedures, um, since they do get more serious each procedure. She had the surgery, and everything went very well. In a few days, she was at home. Uh, so that was great, you know, we get back to like a normal, a somewhat normal um, uh, routine, you know, of having a new baby girl. <laughs> Are you ticklish? Are you ticklish? Are you going to talk to me? Can you tell us a little story about your day? Emma's first five and a half months were, were great. She 
did everything a baby should do. I was always worried, is she going to be a normal, you know, productive baby? Is she going to learn all the skills she should when other babies do? And, and she did. She hit all of her milestones when she should. She was tiny. She was, you know, a little petite thing. Um, but did everything she needed to do. That part was exciting. But always in the back of your mind, you know, four or five more months, we're going to have to, we're going to have to do this again. When Emma was five and a half months old uh, was her second procedure, uh, and that was called a Glenn procedure. And this was really when the, the replumbing, as we called it, would start. Um, in this surgery, they would, uh, in a sense, connect Emma's superior vena cava, which provides blood flow through to the brain and her pulmonary artery. She did beautifully. It was another quick and easy procedure. She was in the hospital six days, and we came home. The first two surgeries were in and out. You know, she's having open heart surgery and she's home in a few days. And we're like, that's awesome. After Emma's second surgery, so she's around five and a half months, um, we knew we'd have a few years off, if you will. And um, we knew we'd have a few years of a break because we knew the next surgery was going to be the most trying on her physically. She had made it through these surgeries and that her function of her heart was better than they, they thought it was going into that third surgery. So they were even, they were able to do a different procedure that gives her a better outlook. Parts of Emma's heart anatomy had developed better than they thought it would. So they decided to change her procedure from a Fontan to the Ristelli. The heart itself, inside the chambers, um, we create a baffle. Or in other words, we direct the blood to go through the correct artery by using a, a graft. We want to get basically all the blue blood going to the lungs, all the red blood going to the body. The surgery went beautifully. And I just remember saying to the nurse, I want to see her feet. So she lifted up the blanket so I could see her feet. And they were the most beautiful shade of pink I've ever seen. I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. It was more overexcitement. She's gonna be off this machine and we're gonna go home in six days because six seemed to be the magic number. Two days went by, still on the ventilator. Three days went by, still on the ventilator. Just had one complication after the next. Not only did she have her lungs partially collapsed, not only did she have a rare form of pneumonia, now she has a blood disorder and now she has a hole in her heart. It's not easy to, to tell parents that their child will require multiple operations, and it's especially uh, challenging to uh, get them to understand when an unexpected additional operation will be required. The course of therapy is not always going to be 100% predictable. I think I went back to where I was staying every night and cried myself to sleep. Is she going to be all right? It felt like we were back at the beginning, the beginning of the unknown. I mean, I'm like, is she, she going to die? She was on a ventilator, it seemed like forever, and they wanted her awake or somewhat awake. So, you know, it's very tough to keep a three-year-old, you know, semi-conscious and on a ventilator. How do I explain to her that this is for your own good? They're taking care of you, you know, it will get better. Because at that point, I honestly, I didn't know if it was gonna get better. And it's killing that. I mean, it's killing me. You know, and you can see that look in her face and she's looking at us going, Daddy, why aren't you helping? I can't help, I can't, I can't do anything. They say this is what's best. I have to, I have to let them do what's best. She went in for her fourth surgery. We actually ran into a surgeon in the hallway. And we usually don't see him before surgery. And I remember Chuck saying to him, just promise me you're gonna take care of her. And he said, I, I promise, I will. And I knew, I just, it gives me chills to think of that. I just remember every, moment of sitting in that hallway. And he promised he would take care of her, and he did. I had uh, 
I had complete confidence in, in Emma, in, in her strength. She was always a strong little girl, um, and that she was going to make it through that operation. She came out of that surgery, was off the ventilator the next day, and we came home six days later. Hi, my name is Emma Provenzano, and I am seven years old, and tomorrow I am turning eight. She's my inspiration. She really, you know, she, she, she keeps me strong. Like, she's seven, and she's been through a lot of stuff. And if she can do it, then, you know, then I can, I can do it, and I shouldn't complain about it too much. To me, she's my hero. Um, I don't know that I could have gone through what she did and still come out smiling and not have let it scar me for the rest of my life. I somehow knew as a newborn what kind of person she was going to be, though. I want to be a teacher and a golf player. She is, uh, she's, she's bright, she's, she's vivacious, she's friendly, and she may still be a little bit too young to be appreciative, but um, she's going to be, she's going to be appreciative. We owe everything to the Children's Miracle Network and their hospitals. So without, without the doctors and the facility that they work in, I really don't know where she would be, so I can just never tell them thank you enough. Um, it's simply that, thank you. The Children's Miracle Network has certainly served as a reminder to me that, that the community appreciates what we do here and, and the community wants to understand what we do. And that helps us a lot. The Children's Miracle Network was always there. Their staff was always there checking on us and making sure that we had the things that we needed. And they were just supportive in every possible way. It's really important for me because I want kids to live their dreams like me. And I'm looking forward to knowing Emma for the rest of her life. Um, certainly through the rest of my life.